One thing that is kind of a main theme that I was thinking of when I was preparing to come over and be part of this gathering was, of course, it's Mother's Day. Not that I'm particularly interested in celebrating that as a commercial story, but we do have a mother to celebrate. And probably the only one that really, really counts right now, uh, because without her, there is nothing else, at least in this form. And what I was interested in was about how do we reimagine this relationship, which obviously it's going to be off the rail. <laughs> and I like to go out in space, bring you back into the detail, and then shoot out the other way as a way of uh, trying to encapsulate the diversity of themes that have been touched during the day and how big this story really is, uh, in, no matter which, from which perspective we are looking at it. So I'd like to start with a, with a big question, I guess. And maybe some of you will be laughing, it's like, but we already know the answer to that. The question would be, does the sun go around the earth? And uh, you might be surprised because, of course, we kind of know now that oh, the sun doesn't go around the earth. But this one actually was a theory that was firmly set in place forever. <laughs> it's uh, based on Aristotelian, uh, Aristotelian physics. And uh, we actually believed in this story for 1,500 years and probably more. Then we changed our mind. And so we started asking a different question. We started asking the possibility or considering the possibility, what if the Earth is the one going around the sun? And of course, as I said, it took 1,500 years to even ask this question. And I guess the reason for me to bring it up is like, uh, well, how is it that we change our mind? Because if we change our mind, to something that was so well ingrained and firmly set for a, over a thousand years. And then so easily we just flipped over, changed the mind, and changed our worldview and changed our relationship with the world. And now these, you know, in this case, these two celestial bodies are related to each other. Then it means the change can be quite straightforward. It can be relatively simple. And it's just a matter of like uh, knowing how to change our mind about things. And then the perspective changes and everything changes and it just, it becomes the new normal. And right now maybe we need to be reminded, at least I do, <laughs> to be reminded that uh, change is totally possible. It does not require some enormous effort as we seem to be told all the time by the bad news that we are fed all the time. And instead, it's just literally, how willing are you to change your mind about things? So how did we get to reimagine this relationship between the two celestial bodies? Because that might give us insights. And if we look at the time when this change occurred, we need to go back to the 1600s, where both theories were plausible. Both of them were considered like they are here, we don't have proof for either of them, but you know, they're possible. And not only that, but they were actually discussed as like two potential rival hypotheses. So it wasn't like, uh, you know, there was a conversation. And one thing that it might surprise you is like, even the Catholic Church was supportive of this dialogue. And in fact, not only was supportive, but it was urging and blessing Copernicus to say, like, just write your bloody book. And the guy, which of course, he was a, a famous scientist, and the entire theory is actually named after him as well, he had to wait for almost, you know, getting close to his deathbed to actually write the book on the relationship on these two heavenly bodies. Here is the interesting thing. So now, you have for a thousand, over a thousand years, you have a particular story, and everyone believes in that. Then someone comes and says, well, oh, what about this other story? And we start the conversation. And uh, even the church, is, which is you know, representing the conservative part of our humanity and our mind, is kind of like, yeah, yeah, let's discuss this. So it's in support of that conversation. And then 
You just wait another century for someone like Galileo to arrive, and he's persecuted and not treated very well, and you know, they kind of threaten him with torture, and in the end he dies uh, in house arrest because under the, the, the order of the church. So the question is, how is he the, um, I guess, the mainstream, at the time it would have been represented, say, by the, the body of the church, would be on one side supportive and actually urging one scientist to write about this theory, and on the other side prosecuting the other, and pretty much like if they could, it would have you know, burnt him to the stake, and instead he was lucky, and, uh, and he just died under house arrest. What happened there? What happened is actually really important because it wasn't about the idea. The church didn't have a problem with Galileo about thinking, oh, you're thinking that the earth might be the one going around the sun. The church was not impressed with his method. And the method that Galileo used basically changed the, the face of what becomes science through empiricism. And the difference between Copernicus and Galileo is important at this time, and please stay with me because we'll get to it, even if it seems like, what is she getting on about this? But Copernicus proposed an idea, and it was an hypothesis. His claims were just hypothetical, while Galileo actually grounded it. He brought it to life. He brought it here. Basically, he so said, like, well, you know, I, I built my telescope, I can see what's happening, I can work it out, I can get data through basically what becomes the scientific method. And so through my personal experience and observation, I can be led to knowledge of what's happening, so knowing the truth. And of course, if you think of yourself as the church, it's like, hey, you can, you know, you can propose theories, but we hold the knowledge, I tell you the truth. And you can't just have your own personal experience and knowing what's going on. And in a way, this is also echoed in other systems. And uh, last year, I was, recently, I was uh, visiting uh, Mexico, and I was very lucky to be welcome in one of the witch hall communities. And, and I just realized how the witch hall were incorporating the Christian stories, and they had this puppet Jesus and the Mary and all of those. But it was kind of like, isn't it a cool story? They were taking it seriously, but not really seriously. Because for them, the relationship that they had with the plant, in that case, obviously, is the peyote, was like, we have, through personal experience, we have direct access to the truth. We have direct access to God. So why do we need a priest to tell us what the relationship with God should be looking like, should feel like? And in a way, that was a very scientific approach. So, experience and truth connects us to how we know the world. And this knowing is not about the mind, because often we think that, you know, it's the mind that knows. I think that this truth is about the body, and so it needs grounding. And I think it's particularly important in the conversation in this specific community and at large as well, because we might get misled in thinking that just discussing these stories, just having two or more uh, opinions about things, how things might be, like, is the sun going around the earth or is the earth going around the sun? It's enough. And it's not enough. The change happened because of Galileo, because he grounded it. So how do we ground and how, so how do we make the change real? here. Because there are many ingredients, I guess, and, uh, and I'm very interested in uh, what are the ingredients that make this enormous gravitational pull to get us there, to lead us to change. And of course, one of them is imagination, and I was discussing this with Stephanie this morning after her presentation, because uh, I thought, I don't know if the organizers did it on purpose or not, or it's just uh, happening this way, or it's a mix of both, but it's, uh, it was amazing for me to follow through the, the talks and see how there were all of these threads, and I was like, I'm just going to be summarizing basically what everyone else has already said. 
or in other words, we already all know what needs to be spoken, and so all, is, all I need to do is just to remind myself how to bring it to life, ground it. So imagination, of course, is often uh, associated to the mind, and it's, you know, the creative power of the mind to dream of the world and of many worlds. And it's beautiful because we connect really easily with the concept uh, when we see art or when we, you know, listen to music. There are many beautiful experiences that creative endeavor can inspire. And of course, imagination is also part of the scientific process, despite, you know, often uh, not being acknowledged as so. And we got to another important figure in science, Darwin. And in 1871, in The Descent of Man, he actually wrote, imagination is the high, one of the highest prerogatives of the human. He also said, because of our imagination, we can actually, independently of the will, so independently of what we think we want, we think we need, we can come up with incredible, brilliant, novel, groundbreaking, revolutionary ideas and results. So we're talking about grounding again. So in other words, the imagination and all of these beautiful ideas and all these beautiful concepts are embodied. If they're not embodied, they actually, they cannot be seen. It would be the same as saying like, oh, I know of this beautiful song, but I'm never going to sing it to you. I'm never going to let you hear it. It's just beautiful, isn't it? You know of that beauty, and you actually have the experience of that creative power because, you have, because I'm delivering to you the experience through the body, which is, in this case, your ears are going to be able to listen to the sound. So it's a reservoir. Our imagination is expressed through this reservoir of embodied emotions, body language, and uh, of course dance is another beautiful way to express that. And so imagination in action is what is needed. Otherwise, it just remains in the idea world and you'll never know what it really is. And when it becomes an action, then we have the opportunity to change in adaptive way to make the right changes in behavior. And of course, as Darwin already suggested, this is where the innovative solutions come in. This is where all of the, oh, what are we going to do? The world is burning down and we are in this crisis. Yep, there is a crisis. But the, the reservoir of creative, incredible ideas of the human, of the human capacity to to dip into there and embody there, it's beyond our own belief. And so the solution is already here. It's actually in every single body <laughs> that is sitting right here. It's just a matter of like bring it out and ground it. Stop just thinking about it, do it. And don't be afraid. And that's where the trick comes in, I guess. The question would be, sounds good, I'm sold great, inspirational, <laughs> but how? And of course, as I said, every single body here has the, is, a, is the embodiment of that creative. So it's kind of a catch-22. It's like, oh, isn't it cool? You've got the solution. But then you also have the responsibility to bring it out. And because each one of us is unique and special, you are the only one that can bring out that part of the solution and so the owl can only uh, be expressed through the personal experience. And, uh, and that's how we find our own truth and our own knowing that then allows to interface with the truth and knowing of everyone else. And it creates the, be the beautiful picture of change. So the only way in which I can answer to the question of, yeah, but how do we do that, is by sharing my personal experience. And my experience comes from, again, science. <laughs> and uh, and it, for many, my, this, this might sound like quite contradictory because we have this idea that you know, science is not very imaginative, it's actually dry and you know, boring and all of that. Uh, but in fact, you know, I mean, we imagine numbers. Then the moment we write them down, we ground them. But 
you know, it's all based on, you had to first imagine something possible to then be able to do anything, and science is no different from anything else. Science is the same as a painting, and science is the same as the, the song that needs to be sung. So in my case, as it was already mentioned, I was a marine scientist, and uh, I was working uh, on the Great Barrier Reef, and then it was through my personal experience that I had to change. And of course, uh, as is often the case, when change comes and we need to find the courage to embrace that, uh, we go down either with great grace or we go down kicking and screaming. And I did the second one uh, to start with. <laughs> and, um, and what I found as I rolled my way down to, the, to what it felt to me a whole, uh, I found indigenous knowledge and I found plants. Or better, those two maybe found me, I don't know. <laughs> and uh, as it was mentioned, um, the first thing that um, I started asking as in the context of plants was like, uh, well, when I look at the animal research that we've done for decades, uh, they are, you know, communication is a big theme. And this desire for us to, of communicability with the world that is non-human is so strong. We've written so many stories about the wolf talking and the, the tree talking and the oak that's got some wisdom to share. So these stories are repeated in pretty much all cultures. And, uh, and of course, some of these stories are actually still very much alive and embodied in some cultures. And in this context, one really good example, of course, are the Icaros, which are these relationships through sound and acoustics, basically, uh, between the human and, and the non-human, the plant in, in this specific case. So I thought, I wonder, like, we're so obsessed by this story. I wonder, how do you go about testing it? And of course, you need to experience it yourself. And then you need to find out your own truth. And then you'll know. <laughs> And so that's what I did. Uh, of course, I did it as my personal experience, as well as the scientist that needs to f use the methods that we have available to test that. And when you combine the two, you might find strange things, and sometimes you stumble in very beautiful truth, in very beautiful songs. And that's what happened to me, so it was just luck. <laughs> but, um, but I guess there was a mix of wanting to engage wanting to embrace the change, no matter what. And, um, and so, yeah, that's what, what my research started to show, was that what the curanderos in the Amazonian jungle tell us is actually verifiable by science. And not because their truth need verifying by science, but it just isn't it beautiful that we can paint the same pictures with different colors. And in this case, you know, I use the paints that I had, which are my science and my labs and my whatever. But then, you know, as you get used to this, change doesn't look as difficult and as scary as it did at the beginning. So instead of like kicking and screaming, you start kind of like, sort of kind of walking. <laughs> and you get a bit kind of bolder and bolder. And so you start asking even bolder questions. And, um, and so for me, again, based on the personal experience that I had through my own interaction with plants, both psychedelic and non, uh, it was like, well, these plants are teaching me so much. Uh, there is this uh, constant sharing. And uh, I wonder, I'm learning so much, but I wonder if they learn. Do they remember me when we interact? What do they know? What do they remember of the past? And uh, can they? And of course, I had to be very careful not to um, scare my colleague because it was important for these ideas to be grounded. And in my context, the grounding needed to occur within the scientific domain because that's where my power was, or is, maybe. <laughs> and uh, so I started doing experiments, following the rules of the game. And uh, the first plan that came for assistance <laughs> in the story. This is Mimosa pudica, and it's famous because it does this, exactly at that speed. So it's one of the few plants that uh, allows us to experience plants within the time frame that is also shared with the human. So we see movement, and suddenly because the plant is moving, it seems alive. 
and we can feel the connections like, oh yeah, of course, it's alive, look, it's doing stuff. So there is a behavior that we can observe and suddenly we have this personal experience that is necessary to knowing. So Mimosa pudica became also the intelligent plant and this wasn't my idea. <laughs> Uh, I was just testing whether the Mimosa could learn. But Michael Pollan wrote this big article on the New Yorker and Mimosa became famous. And suddenly everyone knew that, oh, plants might be intelligent. Which of course, by definition of the world, of the word, intelligence simply means the ability to choose between two. So, if the plants can choose then, and can discriminate, then it's intelligent. I won't go into the details of the experiment because I want to spend some time on another one. Uh, but basically, to tell the story short, after a few, uh, you know, drop and up again and drop it, and close your leaves and not closing your leaves and all of that, the plants is totally good at remembering what has uh, been happening and using that experience, personal experience, to know the truth. And so the plant knows that I'm getting dropped constantly and it looks scary at the beginning, but then actually there is no consequences, so I can ignore it. And in technical terms, that is a demonstration of what we know as habituation, which basically we have seen everywhere we have looked in the animal kingdom, and now we know the plants do that too. And you're doing that as well, because you're ignoring the sound of the fan and the noise outside and all of that, and you're focusing maybe, hopefully, uh, on me. <laughs> and uh, this ability to selectively remove certain sounds and uh, certain bits of information, the lights, the colors, the smells, and focus on what seems to be important and salient at that time is part of the habituation process. And then today during the panel, someone, like we were first asked, like, what is the plant at the moment? What is the plant that is, uh, you know, exciting you the most? And I said, oh, the, the green pea, the garden pea. The garden pea has taught me so much, and that's why I wanted to spend some time, because I think it might be exciting for you too. While habituation is considered the lower level of, the lowest form of learning, so it's learning, but it's a, yeah, but it's a simple version of learning. Associative learning, or classical conditioning, it requires a little bit more thinking, <laughs> because suddenly you need to put together two things, one which you know of, and the other one, which is totally new and kind of meaningless, and then it might acquire meaning through the process of learning. And uh, I guess you know of this already, because it was, it's a famous form of learning, and you probably know it as the Pavlovian dog experiment, where Pavlov rang the bell. Well, Pavlov noticed first that, of course, when you're about to give a dog his dinner, especially if it's a regular event, uh, the dog will, sal will salivate, excited about his dinner. And then he thought, I wonder if I, can, um, I c if I can teach the dog to associate different cues and using dinner as uh, the cue that is known and a bell that doesn't mean anything, but maybe the dog then can realize that, oh, the bell is going to predict dinner and so I'm going to be interested in the bell after a while. So first, he presented the bell and dinner, the bell and dinner. And then towards the end of the experiment, he only gave the bell. And the dog, by now, although at the beginning the bell didn't mean anything, the dog by now, through personal experience, knew that the bell signified food is coming. And he started salivating even if there was no dinner in sight. Now, there are a few points that are important to make here. One is, you know, you need to be able to detect, discern, and then associate through a system of value. And this is a personal system of value. Not all dogs respond exactly in the same way. So there is something internal about the dog, that, about this one dog and then this one other dog that is creating this system of value. What this means, in other words, is that there is a subject that is making decision based on its own feelings and how it, literally how it feels about the situation, about what's happening around. And so it's involving personal experience. <laughs> 
And this is also important because what he's really saying is that there is a field of perception and the dog, through his own imagination, so creating images of something that is not present yet, but is expected, so he's creating the future in his head, is extending the field of perception. He's, create, he's expanding the perception that it would have onto things that are not even there. This will be the same as saying that dinner, it's in the dog's mind, until Pablo actually delivers. <laughs> so what happens if you do this with a plant? You go through exactly the same kind of procedure, but in the case of a plant, dinner is light, especially blue light, the little pea seedlings, lovely. And then you need something that represents or does the same job as the bell. It needs to be something that the peas really don't care about. It doesn't mean anything. They can perceive it, but they, it's kind of like, I'm choosing not to do anything about it because it's got no, no meaning to me. And then, just like Pavlov, you present the fan, and then it's followed by the light, and then the fan, and by the light. And the normal circumstances when there is just the light, we know very well that the plants have this phototropic behavior, so they will bend towards the light. While we already know, because we established it, that the plant doesn't care about the fan, so it just keeps growing straight. After the, the plant has the experience of like a fan, light, fan, light, and then suddenly, just like Pavlov had done with the dog and presented only the bell, I just presented only the fan. And basically what I'm asking the plant to show me is, do you know what this means? And the plant, which normally before training, so before its own experience of the two cues put together, would just not care, bends towards the fan. What he's saying to me is, the fan didn't mean anything to me, but through personal experience, now I know that he's gonna predict the light. And because I want the light, I'm gonna go and be prepared and move towards it. But here is the important bit, I guess. Just like the dog, there is someone, not something, but someone in there that is detecting, is discriminating, is evaluating. So we have, again, an internal value system. Or, just like the dog, we have a subject who is feeling and experiencing. And just like the dog, there is an extension of the perceptual field. The plant, just like the dog, is projecting itself <laughs> into the future, imagining something that is not in the environment, but he knows it's coming based on his experience. And so it follows that just like the dog, <laughs> dinner, or light in this case, it's in the mind of the plant. So the real question is like, so what is the mind? And this is a, a big question. And it's a big question, not so much of like, oh, so what do you mean? But it's more like uh, just the question has the capacity to disrupt the linear thinking of decades of science. And this is the power, this is what Galileo did. This is what much of the science that has changed anything has done before. It disrupts the past to just show an alternative vista, an alternative view to the story. And all because someone decided to ask a stupid question. <laughs> imagined a different possibility. And not only imagined it, it decided that it must be embodied. Can it be embodied? And if it is embodied, and everyone has got a body, then it's everywhere. What I learned personally through this uh, experimental journey was that imagination is at the heart of all nature. Plants do it. Plants have their own version of. We, as the human animal, have our own version of. Uh, other creatures have their own version of. And none of them is less or more, it's just we do it maybe in our own human way, plant way, whatever way. <laughs> and not only that, 
but also everyone has a mind. And this is how everyone is dreaming the world into being. So the imagination creates this bridge. But unless the mind and the heart are nice and grounded, both of them, you don't have a bridge. Your imagination is going to do nothing. It's going to be the song that nobody has ever heard, the unsung. And we can't afford that. For me, it, it was that kind of bridge that allowed me to step across those gaps that look like, ooh, too scary, <laughs> can't do that. And then you step anyway. It also allowed me to integrate because of these two needs to be grounded. Then it allowed me to integrate what looked like discrepancies, what looked like different worlds that didn't make sense. They were looking like paradoxical to each other. Like either you go one or the other, it can be both. But of course you can, why not? This is where then you have new understanding uh, emerging. And this is where new inspiration comes. This doesn't have to be then a personal affair because then the inspiration can touch anything, can, is infective. So it will infect anyone that wants it. So I hope you get infected <laughs> in the best way possible, of course. In my case, it, it required a change that then in turn changed not only my life, but my entire perception of the world, just like for the plant. Suddenly I had a different internal value system in operation. So if we go back to the initial question, as you can see, there is a pattern here that of course I've been probably overemphasizing. And again, I'm gonna repeat this because I think it's really important, it's like, a, we have so many ideas in this room just in one day. Just think about how many conversations you had, how many crazy ideas, how many things you have already heard, how many things are new, how many things are going to boil in the background and then reemerge who knows when to inspire you to think differently. And so how do we come to change our mind about the world? Well. We actually have the perfect model because life and the world seems to be kind of constantly being reimagined. It's a process that is ongoing. And we have a really big and beautiful role model for this, for the grounding that is required to bring these, all of these beautiful dreams into life. I felt it was a really good way, being the last speaker, to, you know, close the conference because the role model is her. She grounds every single dream that has ever been dreamt of. And the way in which she does it, she literally, from the ground, creates forms made of that ground. And some of them can walk, some of them fly, some of them swim, and it's like the diversity is beyond belief. And if we can see that, then suddenly, and I know we have, I heard, you know, in different places today, like this, almost this pain, because it is painful, because it's not real, <laughs> this pain of like, uh, oh, there is the separation, is the separation, the problem is the separation. But actually, that's not the problem, because if you believe that you are separate, then it's fine. But if you stop a minute and just remember exactly what you are, you're made of dirt. <laughs> and you are walking dirt. While there is other dirt that doesn't walk, but you know, it turns green. And then there is other dirt that flies. And, uh, and if you remember that, then suddenly you know that you are nothing, the most amazing nothing, connected to this big blob in space. And when I spoke of the gravitational pull, and I said, oh, you know, there must be a lot of ingredients brought in to cook up this, this embrace, you know? The embrace is from her. For all you know, you, will be up, you, will, you could be easily upside down, sideways, and yet it feels like you're here. She holds you here. Because you are, you are her. 
So I think it's a good way to say Happy Mother's Day. <laughs> Thank you. I really love what you said about Icaros. I've been listening to some of the Icaros from Temple of the Way of Light, and I just wondered um, if you had any shamans or particular tribes that you could recommend as far as Icaros that you found powerful and resonated with you. You cannot recommend an Icaro <laughs> for a very simple reason, because the Icaro, the real Icaros, the one that are actually, and this is interesting because yesterday I was asked a very similar question, and, um, and at least this is my personal experience of that. So, but the, the Icaros that can operate as the scalpel of a doctor and really remove the tumor or you know, heal whatever, cannot be acquired because someone is singing it for you. Beautiful songs have been written in those spaces. But the Icaros, the one that are really medicine, the one that really heal, most of the time don't actually sound that good. <laughs> and in my experience, they can only be given as an offering through the relating with this other, the plant in this case. And uh, it's a perfect question because uh, it, they can only be really experienced as a personal affair between you and the plant. And that it's not because you're sitting in ceremony a couple of times and, you know, oh, and I had this beautiful song singing in my head and that's the Icaro. That's a beautiful song. The Icaro, at least in my experience, is not something that you sing because, isn't it nice, I'm going to sing your Icaro now. <laughs> the Icaro sings you. The Icaro uses you as the vehicle to heal what is needed. So the moment you think you have an Icaro and you acquired something, or you have, you know, you go and talk to this shaman and he sings it and you record it and then you sing it back, you have an, a song. Beautiful, maybe, maybe not. But to me, that's not an Icaro. But again, I have to highlight, this is my personal experience. So, Given that uh, mainstreaming of psychedelics is such a fascinating and, and progressive discussion at the moment, what are your thoughts on, I guess we're talking about appropriation, commodification of the plants on the one hand but the psychedelic experience on the other for medical or for whatever, whatever purposes. So what are your thoughts on that? Is there a way of reconciling all of that? Because so much of what you've been talking about I think has sort of touched on touched on that. Where do we go? To what degree do we um, maintain a respect for the plants and the psychedelic experience and to what degree do we, um, to, do we appropriate and utilise them for our, own, for our own purposes? Well, if you are um, depressed or if you have cancer and you run to the doctor and ask them to give you some drug, it really doesn't matter what it is that they give you, whether it's like some pharmaceutical blah, blah, or it's like, uh, oh, here is the magic mushroom, you know, this is natural, so it's good for you, and now we have this revival, isn't it amazing? It doesn't really matter because uh, you're still refusing to take responsibility for the reason why you're even there. That is what matters. It's like, why did you take yourself to the point of having to relinquish your responsibility towards your own body, for example, and, uh, and have to pretend that someone else is going to fix you. <laughs> They're not going to fix you. So if we are going to deploy 
our psychedelic medicines in the, cost, in the context of a medicinal scenario, unless we change our attitude towards health and what it means to be healthy, what it means to be in the body, we are just going to repeat exactly the same. Why would you think that we're going to do something different? So the same issues that we have in relation to, you know, um, yeah, patenting and, you know, certain company making profit or uh, cutting off other people from access, all of those issues are going to just be repeated because it's going to be all over the same mind creating the same story. So if you are depressed, work out why did you get there. If you have cancer, you don't have, you, you're not there to be fixed. Cancer is your opportunity to see how you got there. Is your kicking and screaming down the hole. And what you need to remember is that that kicking and screaming is useful. Maybe it's the only way in which you're going to actually embrace change. I'm going to share a, pers a personal experience um, because I think we have a bit of a... My feeling is that we might have a little bit of a distorted version of what health, life, and death really mean to us. Uh, this is about 10 years ago. I went to the Philippines and, uh, with a friend, and uh, I went and visited this um, psychic healer. And, uh, and I was very curious to see myself, so I have my own experience of what these psychic healers are doing. And of course, I knew that there were plenty of stories about, oh, you know, they are all a fraud. They're just using chicken blood, and then you know, they they do little scalpels and stuff, and then you don't see it, but it's all happening. It's nothing special. And and uh, but well, my experience with these men in particular was very different. And uh, I didn't need an, I didn't really need any healing. And in fact, when it's like, can you do it to me? It's like, uh, why? I was like, I just want to know <laughs> how it feels. But of course, there was people there that was very serious. Actually, these were um, mostly European, and my friend's mom was taking them to visit this healer in the Philippines because they were all terminal cancer patients, to the point where the European doctors were like, yeah, just prepare, clean up your business, you know, prepare for dying. And uh, so I guess in those situations, you don't have anything to lose, right? They already told you, basically, you're dead. So what are you going to do about that? And so you can do anything. And so these people went to see this healer. And um, some of them returned to Europe, and there was no more cancer. Some of them returned to Europe and passed. One of these people, I, was, uh, he, I had a close relating with this one person, because this was a man who had a really horror brain tumor. So much that he couldn't walk anymore, he needed assistance all the time, and you could tell there was pain and there was a lot of anger. And when I spoke to the, to the Filipino healer, I said to him like, so do you think you're gonna fix it? <laughs> and he said to me like, I'm not fixing anyone. All I'm doing is allowing for the opportunity for him to release his anger. And I was like, what? But he's got a brain tumor. I was like, yeah, but that's not the problem. <laughs> so what happened, I was there for two weeks. And in the course of two weeks, he was there with his wife and his son. And he was absolutely horrible to them, like really nasty. And all of his anger was basically fuming and being thrown all over them. And at one point, I think something changed. And there was a breakthrough. And through, you know, a lot of processes and a lot of dancing around the fire and carrying him, <laughs> something switched. And he, this big man, so angry and in so much pain, suddenly broke down into tears and begged them to forgive him. When he passed away, once he returned to France, because he was a Frenchman, when he passed away, I spoke to the wife and the son, and, and they were like, oh, I'm sorry for your loss. And I was like, no, no, no. You know, you don't understand the healing that occurred in that moment. He, just, he was just waiting for that moment so that he could go. 
He couldn't go. He ref what he refused was not to leave, not, not to die. He refused to die with that pain. He needed to release the pain. But in our culture, we don't understand. So from a Western perspective, we would say, oh, the, the healer basically failed. He didn't save him. And instead, from the experience that this family had and uh, my learning through them was like, a, oh my God, he was right. He told me from the beginning, he's not here to heal the cancer as the brain tumor. He's here because of his anger. And once the anger was released, he was ready to die. So I think that we have a lot of work to do in understanding in changing our mind, or how we see life in relation to death, what death really means to us. In our culture, really, is pretty much a taboo. Uh, you know, we put that, the dying away, and, uh, and once they're dead, we put them definitely away. <laughs> and um, instead of embracing that dying also means the celebration of a life. And if you lived well, if you dreamt well, then dying, yeah, great achievement, you made it. So in the answer you just gave, you proposed the idea of fundamentally reimagining how we do healthcare, how we engage with processes of death and dying. You pointed out both sort of the personal experience of uh, traumatic health situations uh, and also suggested that we consider the broader context, right? The fact that uh, where, where is cancer coming from when we have industrial capitalism sort of chewing up the planet and spitting out all sorts of pollutants? Where does depression come from when we live in incredibly atomized societies, et cetera, et cetera? So I, nice. <laughs> so I guess a question would be, as somebody who works uh, within an institutional context, have you encountered um, effective mechanisms for pushing back against some of these entrenched uh, elements of dominant culture within that institutional setting? And do you have a sense of what it would take to actually uh, orient some of those individual institutions to sort of push towards those much needed shifts? The quick answer is yes, uh, but. <laughs> yes, in the sense that and this is something that is close to me, so I'm sure that it's probably happening in different fronts, and I'm just maybe not aware, but there are definitely two fronts that I'm aware of. This is within academia. And it's uh, on one front is the legal front, and I'm not talking about legalizing one plant, or, but giving rights, legal rights, and personhood to, to systems that we might not even consider like persons. And of course, there's been with the, the fir one of the first was the Fanganui River in New Zealand, who was given personhood status, and he's got because the river in a in a court case cannot speak for himself, then he's got the, under the custodianship of the of the indigenous people of that area, they have the right to speak on his behalf. And it's not just the river, like literally just the water that is moving. But the river is the land that is holding the water, the plants that, is all, that are holding, so the forest that is holding uh, with the roots, the land that is holding the water, the people who know how to, for example, in some cases we have heard before, like some species we know they need fire. So some species need to be cut down and for regeneration. There are so many, so, Understanding this relationship allows us to understand what kind of person are we talking about and who is the person that needs the rights. So the Fanganui River, after I think it took them 10 years or something of you know, court appeals and all of that, but I think last year or the year before, finally was given personhood status and is, as that, it was in his right, as the river, to be left alone. So they stopped a, uh, a chemical company that wanted to dam the river so that they could use the waters to just flush down their chemicals and it, they would have polluted the entire area and killed all sorts of animal, plants, soil, and all of that. So that is a powerful change. But this is happening, then from there it just escalated. Because as I said, these ideas, when change arrives, and when real is really grounded, 
uh, then it becomes uh, like an infectious disease and it goes everywhere. And so then suddenly we hear about another place and the Ganges in ri uh, river in India of all places becomes like, oh, we're going to give personhood to this spiritual person, the river. And whether that, in that context, is going to have the same effect as in New Zealand, who knows? But at least there, is a, there are the tools to then, if there is a potential threat, to say, like, okay, I'll take you to court. You're breaching my rights as the river. And then that extended to mountains. And uh, a really close friend and colleague of mine uh, just was at the UN two weeks ago. And he was called in to moderate this session which was all about ecological jurisprudence, earth law. And what they're discussing are the new legal frameworks to be able to take, for example, big corporation, the international corporation, uh, to, into a law suit. But not where the lawyers are fighting with each other, but like where one of the parties in the court is representing an entire mountain, an entire forest, an entire river, an entire, an entire system. Um, this is very successful in some country, and I think the US is a very good example of you know, the potential for this to really work well. Australia, for what I understand, uh, requires a different approach, not in the sense of like we can't have a, a river that is a person, but more like uh, how to fiddle with the legal rules that we have available, the tools that are available. But it's possible, and I know that colleagues are working on this in relation to the Fitzroy of the Kimberleys. And of course, the Fitzroy is a very good example because they want to do the same that they did to the Mary Darling. <laughs> and he's like, oh, that's a brilliant idea. Look what it, oh, it worked. Your management strategy there worked fantastic. That's why we don't have a river anymore. And so they want to reapply and redeploy the same to the, Mar uh, to the Fitzroy River. And so this time, the, the people who are watching are not just the ones that want to exploit, but also the one that's like, uh, who is there as the person that is going to have his or her rights uh, impinged on? And in this case, it's going to be the river. And it's not going to be the river as, again, just the water, but all of the indigenous groups. And there is, I think, three or four at least in the entire Kimberleys, through the entire basin of that river, who are you know, involved in, in the relating with this river. And then, of course, there is the land, the plants, and the river goes all the way to the ocean. And so suddenly, you're not talking about just the river, but you're talking about the reef at the end on the other side, where the river comes out. And so if you can see, this could be a very nice system to protect what needs our protection from ourselves. <laughs> and so that is a good example. The other example that I know of, which is kind of related, is more of, um, so this one is a very practical and grounded. The other one I think is still um, more on the conceptual, but uh, it, it has, the people involved in there have all the intention to ground it. And this is uh, a movement or a conceptual space called planetary health. It's driven by medical researchers. But they are very aware of the fact that the medical crisis cannot be resolved just fixing people. You know, if you don't fix the environment where these people are living, and if you don't change the, uh, the working environment, the relational spaces, and all of that, you're not going to solve the problem. So planetary health is another good example happening right now, where um, we are considering the medical issue, the ecological crisis, and all of these, uh, even the economy, the social structure, culture, politics, all as part of the, the one picture. And so it's a very highly diverse, ultra multidisciplinary space where you have the medicals, the anthropologists, the social scientists, the scientists, the law, the, and they're all converging together. And I guess this is more of a conceptual space still because it's not easy to get these different perspectives to talk to each other, literally. Like they all use different language and sometimes I talk to my, like if I talk to a philosopher, I'm like a 
got nothing. <laughs> Can you break it down <laughs> into words that I might understand? And they, I think that I'm speaking clearly as the scientists, and they're like, no, didn't get that. So we literally had to learn how to talk to each other again. And that is the main kind of hurdle. But there is the willingness. So it's happening. And these are two examples that I know of that are literally occurring right now. And the reason why they're important is because they are within the mainstream, because they are embedded inside what we feel is the system that is creating the problem. And they're changing it from inside and thanks to the pressure that is coming from the outside. So as we talked already, it's like, uh, you know, both are required. And, uh, and everyone is placed just perfectly where they are to do what they need to do. They just need to do it. 